Hello, I'm uh, Anthony Chan. I'm a consultant rheumatologist in London, United Kingdom, and reporting here at ACR21 on the Room Now website. And today I'm uh, joined by Dr. Nelly Zert. She's from Lebanon. She's a rheumatologist in Lebanon, and she has done some interesting work, which she has presented here at ACR21. So welcome, uh, Dr. Zia. Uh, and Thank you. We're very interested to hear about uh, the work that you're doing done with ASAS, the PERSPA study. Uh, one of the questions that we have is how we define peripheral spondyloarthritis. While we are very clear about axial spondyloarthritis, the area of peripheral SPA is sometimes still a bit of a mix back as to what exactly defines this population. So uh, poster 1787 is very interesting and we wanted to get your thoughts about the, uh, the findings from your study. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Uh, so I am, uh, I'm an ASAS member, and that's why uh, we had the opportunity to study the PERSPA database. The PERSPA database was conducted by Professor Maxime Dugados and uh, Dr. Clementina Lopez Medina. And uh, the main results were published. And after that, we had the opportunity to access the data for other research questions. And uh, one of the interesting questions was about peripheral SPA, because we know that peripheral SPA is not very defined. And uh, there's a lot of overlap between peripheral SPA and the other uh, SPA subtypes like axial and psoriatic arthritis. So we decided to conduct this uh, ancillary analysis of PERSPA. Uh, to try to understand first what is the prevalence of peripheral SPA among the SPA um, cohort, and then uh, especially the pure form, so the one where you don't have any overlap between axial SPA and the psoriatic arthritis. And also, we wanted to check the phenotype of these uh, patients and the burden of disease in these patients. So we used the uh, two approaches. So uh, PERSPA has more than 4,000 uh, participants. We used the uh, patients who were uh, uh, diagnosed by their uh, physician as uh, peripheral, axial, or psoriatic arthritis. And we used two, criteria, two approaches to uh, define peripheral SPA. The first one was based on the criteria approach. And so we looked at the ASAS criteria uh, for axial and peripheral SPA and the CASPAR criteria for psoriatic arthritis. And using this approach, we found that uh, peripheral SPA uh, was, um, okay, let me check the number. So of uh, 4,185 patients, 1,317 had peripheral SPA according to the criteria approach. So around 31%. While when we used the diagnostic approach, meaning uh, what the rheumatologist said uh, was the main disease, uh, one of the main spa disease about, about the patient, it was uh, 433, so it was 10%. So whether you use the criteria approach or you use the diagnostic approach, the percentage of uh, peripheral spa will be different. Uh, and when you look specifically at, at pure peripheral SPA, you can see that using the criteria approach, you have 17% who were classified as peripheral SPA. 17% of peripheral SPA are pure peripheral SPA. And when you use the diagnostic approach, 62% of patients have pure SPA out of all peripheral SPA. So I don't want to confuse you with numbers, but when you use the criteria in a non-restrictive way, you have, uh, you have more peripheral SPA as combination. Whereas when you use the diagnostic approach, you have more peripheral SPA as pure SPA. So when uh, you use the physician's judgment, the peripheral SPA has to be pure in order to be categorized or labeled as peripheral SPA. What are, your, what are your thoughts uh, in terms of the differences between a criteria-based uh, approach versus a clinical, a clinician-based approach in terms of trying to define this better? Yeah, I think that uh, when, uh, in the mind of the rheumatologist, when the patient has a peripheral spa combined with axial and psoriatic arthritis, we have a tendency to uh, diagnose the patient with 
other things than a peripheral scar. So if you have peripheral and axial, we have a tendency of diagnosing in priority as axial spa. And the, this should not, uh, the peripheral spa part should not be neglected because if you look at the burden of the disease, the burden of patient with peripheral spa as pure peripheral spa was higher than the burden of pure axial spa and pure psoriatic arthritis. So really these patients who have peripheral spa have a high burden of disease and have less use of biotherapies, so meaning they might be undertreated. So this study highlights that we need really a better definition of peripheral spa. We need a better identification of the disease. And we really need, need to pay attention to these patients because they are suffering from their disease and they are, might be undertreated. So there is also some work uh, at the ACR21 where they have done it the other way around, where they have taken the, the psoriatic arthritis patients and meant to study if they have pure axial disease, so the opposite way of uh, this study. And that percentage was quite low. It was only about 2% uh, where they had pure axial uh, PSA. Um, and in time, they seem to have developed more peripheral symptoms. In your mind, do you think these are two separate conditions, as in uh, axial PSA or somebody with expa with psoriatic arthritis, or do you think they are probably the same condition but just evolving differently over time? Yes, we have reasons to believe that these patients have like are evolving under the same big umbrella of spondyloarthritis. But it's not, uh, I, I don't think that you should lump them all together. I think that there are some specificities. It's the same disease spectrum, but there are some specificities, specificities that we should know about because they will have a lot of therapeutic implication as it may look. So maybe patients with axial psoriatic arthritis would respond to other um, biologics like interleukin-17 inhibitor more than patients who have axial spa who would maybe respond better to uh, drugs like TNF inhibitors. So I think that there's a lot to, uh, to understand about that uh, in the future. Thank you. I think that's a very important point. The, uh, the treatment response will be very different based on the classification of uh, these two groups. So thank you. That is a very, uh, very interesting work. And thank you for your work to help define peripheral SBA is uh, a bit better for us. I also uh, have um, reviewed that uh, you're also doing some very interesting work where you are looking at um, patient acceptability of the COVID-19 vaccine and also the use of telehealth, uh, some of the other posters that you're presenting here. Uh, I just wonder whether you could give us some key points or key highlights from uh, some of the other work that you're doing. Yes, so uh, we have three abstracts presented on behalf of the ARLAR, the Arab League of Association for Rheumatology. And uh, the first one is about the acceptance or the hesitancy regarding the COVID-19 vaccine in our region. So when we talk about the ARLAR region, uh, the study included 19 uh, countries. We included uh, more than 3,000 participants and tried to understand their hesitancy. Uh, and so, uh, briefly, if I want to share a little bit of, of results, in these 3,000 patients, uh, like it was half patients and the controls were uh, HCPs, health uh, care uh, professionals. And you can uh, see that, you can, as expected, the patients have more uh, hesitancy and uh, the acceptability of the vaccine. The this, this study was done in um, April, May, 2021. The acceptability of the COVID-19 vaccine by the patient was 63%. And by the HCPs, it was 81%. So also both of them were not really optimal. What the study added it, is that we tried to understand uh, why would people accept uh, the, the vaccine? And this is a reason like uh, to, to, to take action. And actually the main determinants of acceptability were perceptions regarding vaccination in general. So not really related to their rheumatic disease, not really related to the fear of flare or to the uh, uh, drugs, 
they were afraid about the vaccine in general because there's a lot of uh, uncertainties, especially at that time. They were afraid about the side effect of, of the vaccine in general. It was correlated with their previous perception about vaccine, previous um, intake of uh, influenza vaccine. So what we highlighted in this uh, first study is that uh, there is some uh, hesitancy in patients and in healthcare professional, and we need to really to address this to be able to uh, implement the vaccine in the general population. And actually what we needed to do is to be more transparent about the risk of side effect, to communicate better with them. And this is what we did actually using our social media platform. We addressed these, um, these concerns uh, by like ma making webinars and posts just to reassure the patients about the uh, risk of the vaccines. And so, so hopefully, was, uh, hopefully with yeah. time, your, your uptake will be uh, higher than 63%. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And like anything new, I think we, are, we were all facing the same, same challenge uh, last year. Um, hopefully in the years to come, this would this will change with more information. And uh, the mm -hmm. last bit is about the um, acceptance of telehealth. How Do you do telemedicine then? Do you use a lot of that? Yes, we had to do it on, uh, on an emergency basis. We, we, didn't, we didn't have the structure to do it. And the RLR countries have uh, really are not homogeneous. You have uh, countries with very high GDP, very high, very good infrastructure, and countries who have uh, very low GDP and really no, no infrastructure at all. So it was really a challenge creating, creating these guidelines for, uh, for telehealth uh, in, in rheumatology. And uh, what we did actually, we gathered people from uh, the different uh, Arab countries. Uh, we did a, uh, three uh, Delphi rounds. We did, of course, a literature review. We studied the challenges uh, that were specific to our region. And we did three Delphi rounds with voting. And we, uh, uh, we, we published four general principles and 12 statements. And uh, it was really addressing uh, the ideas of confidentiality, of uh, patient informed consent. So it was more of a guidance that should be later on applied in each country because each country has different, um, have different uh, jurisdictions, different uh, laws. So we gave like general guidance, like to give a, um, to legalize the format so people really can use it because it's a new idea and when it's there's a new there are new ideas it's difficult to implement we had also on the panel patients we had payers we had regulators so we listened to everyone's uh, idea and uh, i hope that this will be implemented in practice we also did a triage system like a sort of orientation for the rheumatologist about what are the cases where uh, telemedicine can be applied and what are the cases where it really really shouldn't and we should really bring in the patient. So I think patient selection is uh, quite important uh, yeah. in, in, uh, in trying to use these new technologies. And yeah. I think for certainly in our experience, um, there are certain groups of patients where this would work very well for them, uh, but for others, um, they would still be better to be seen in person. Um, so thank you very much for your time uh, and you know these are very yeah, interesting and important studies uh, so thank you for your time and uh, we enjoy the uh, the rest of the ACR 21 so we're thank reporting you, from yeah thank you we're reporting from room now thank you